I'm really glad I get to be a part of this series where we're looking at some of the, some of the great stories from the Old Testament. One of the things I'd like to do today is kind of look at the story of David and Goliath, see if we can learn some things from it. And then I'd like to tell you a story from my own life. A lot of you know that uh, my parents became Christians just shortly before I was born, uh, apparently realizing they were going to need a lot of help. And so they started attending a, a church like a block from our house, and that became really uh, the center of their lives and our lives as a family. And I can remember as a kid, like six, seven years old maybe, you know, sitting on folding chairs in a semicircle, and Mrs. Walensky teaching us the story of, of David and Goliath using flannel graph. Any of you remember flannel graph? Low tech, very, very low, low tech. And, and I can remember being uh, in awe of a story like that, David and Goliath. But then some things happened in my life, and I began to question whether or not that was actually a true story or not. In my mind, I was kind of putting it in the category of like Jack and the Beanstalk or Aesop's Fables or something like that. Not really a true story, but still a good story and something we could learn from. And it wasn't until uh, later in my life that I, God brought the truth back to me again to realize that, in fact, this is a true story. You know, archaeologically, we found the evidence that there was a king named David in Israel who lived a thousand years before Jesus. You know, I, have, I have been to the Elah Valley that it talks about in the story of David and Goliath. I've picked up smooth stones from that, that riverbed. And one of the things that, that has helped me in all of this is to say that, that both of these things can be true. That on the one hand, I can believe this is a real historic story about some real people. It's a story that God wanted told about how he used people and was involved in, in people's lives and, and in, uh, in working in our, in our world. On the other hand, it seemed to me like that like that wonder and awe that I felt as a, you know, as, as a seven-year-old sitting in Mrs. Wolinsky's Sunday school class. It seems like I could kind of find that again, too, that I could kind of marvel at this amazing story about this young boy and this huge giant. So we're getting into this series looking at some of these amazing Old Testament stories. David and Goliath is what we're going to look at today. So... Uh, so I want you to join with me, and as much as you can, I want you to sort of put on the seven, eight-year-old mentality and see if you can appreciate again the, uh, the amazing story of God at work in our world. To do that, we kind of need to set it in context. So you remember that Israelites, God's people, were in slavery in Egypt 400 years. God brings them out under the leadership of Moses and Joshua, brings them to the, to the promised land, this land that became Israel. And there, they're just kind of a, a loose nation. And when there was a, a need for leadership, God would raise up someone, the Bible calls them judges, who would, who would lead them militarily or civilly, you know, during whatever the crisis was. People like Samson or Gideon or, or Deborah, yes, there were women judges in the Bible as well. And, and that worked really well for a long time. And then the Israelites sort of got got antsy. They wanted, they, doggone it, we would just like to be like other nations. And other nations had kings. And so they came to Saul, who was the last of the judges, and they said, you know, speak to God for us. We, we want a king. And Samuel said, you don't, you don't know what you're asking for. You know, there are going to be some big problems if, if you have a king. But they insisted. And so God gave them a king. And the first king, you remember, was, was King Saul. Saul had a lot of issues in his life. He was far from a perfect man, but he had a couple things going for him. One, he was a guy, he was a big guy. The Bible says he was head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel. And he was a, he was a good fighter. 
so he could at least lead the army well, and that was important. Because at that time, Israel was often in battle with their neighboring country, the Philistines. The Philistines lived right along the, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. There were five what they called city-states ruled by a king. And together, they made up the Philistines. One of those cities was Gath. And so sure enough, when we come to the story we're looking at today, which is in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, we find that once again, Israel and the Philistines are in battle against each other. And they didn't have exactly like a standing army in Saul's day. But when there was a need, he would send out the word and, and men would volunteer and they would come to be a part of the army. And so here's Saul and these Israeli fighters with him, the army that he's gathered together on one side of this Elah Valley on a hill on one side. And on the other hill on the other side, there is the army of the Philistines. And they're getting ready to go to battle as has happened so often in their past. But this day, something really amazing happens. Out from the, from the Philistine army walks one man, and he is literally a giant. His name is Goliath from Gath. And the Bible says he is a huge man. So it says, it says in 1 Samuel that he was six cubits and a span. So a cubit was basically the length from the tip of your finger to your elbow. That would be a cubit. And a span was the distance that your hand could stretch from your little finger to your thumb. He was six cubits and a span. So that meant that, that Goliath of Gath was, oh my goodness, nine feet tall, give or take. Nine feet tall. And the Bible says that he was covered in armor. So he had a, a breastplate made of bronze. The Bible says it weighed uh, 5,000 shekels. That would be about 100 pounds. So he's wearing this, this armor that weighs 100 pounds. He has armor on his legs and on his arms. He has a, a javelin on his back and he has a sword and he has a spear. And it says the spear, the head of the spear weighed 600 shekels, which would be about 15 pounds. 15 pounds just for the tip of, of this spear that he had. And his, and his shield was so big, he actually had a, a shield bearer who would carry the shield for him. And so on this morning, the sides are drawn up, getting ready for battle. Out from the Philistines walks this giant, this nine-foot Goliath from Gath, covered in armor, and he yells out across the valley to the, to the army of Israel. Why are you drawn up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of your King Saul? I challenge you this day, choose a man to fight with me. And if he defeats me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I kill him, you will be our servants. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Choose a man to fight with me. Now, what do you think the reaction of the Israeli army was when they heard this? They were backing up in fear. I mean, who's going to be crazy enough to fight a guy who's nine feet tall with all that armor? The obvious choice would be their king, right, Saul, because one of the things about him, Saul was a big man too, head and shoulders taller than everybody else. But he's no dummy. He's not going to go fight Goliath, and nobody else is either. Everybody is afraid. Nobody steps out to fight Goliath that day or the next or the next. And for 39 days, the armies are drawn up on these two hills, and every day, morning and evening, Goliath steps out and issues that challenge. You know, choose a man to fight with me today. Nothing happens. Now the story shifts to the city of Bethlehem. We're all pretty familiar with Bethlehem because that's where Jesus was born, right? And uh, one of the things that we know about Bethlehem, even in the, the stories about Jesus, it says it was the city of David. And sure enough, David in the Old Testament, who's a part of this story, came from this village, this town of Bethlehem. David's father was Jesse. Jesse was an old man by this time, and he had eight sons. 
the oldest of his sons were Eliab and uh, Abinadad and Shema. And so those three oldest boys had gone to be a part of Saul's armor, Saul's army. When he'd put out the call for men to come and fight, they had sort of enlisted. And so now they had gone with Saul there, there at the Valley of Elah. And their father, Jesse, wonders how they're doing, how the, how the war is being waged. So he calls for his youngest son. His youngest son is David, who's a shepherd. He's out tending the, the flocks in the hills around Bethlehem. He calls for David. He says, I want you to go to the army and see how your brothers are getting along. And uh, well, it takes some things to him. So he, he fixed some, some bags of grain for him to take and some other supplies and even some cheeses that he could give to the, to the leaders in the army. And he loads him up on a donkey and he sends David on his way. And he says, you know, go and see how your brothers are doing and then come back and get me word. So they load up the donkey. David starts out early in the morning to go about five miles from Bethlehem to the Valley of Elah. And he gets there early in the morning, and all the army is drawn up for battle. And David looks in wonder as he looks across the valley, and he sees this giant coming out and making this challenge. Choose this day a man to fight with me. But nobody does. And David begins to ask, what's going on? How long has this been happening? Why isn't anybody going to fight him? And they explain to him that this is the giant, and nobody's going to be crazy enough to fight him. They'll be killed. And David, who's probably 12, 13 years old at this time, a shepherd boy, says, well, this man shouldn't be able to challenge the, the armies of the living God. I, I will go and fight with him. Word begins to spread that there's this kid who's willing to go and fight with Goliath. When David's brothers hear it, they're not pleased. In fact, Eliab, the oldest, is offended that well, even Eliab wasn't willing to go fight with, with Goliath. And here's David, this kid, saying he's going to fight the giant. Eliab confronts David and says, so who's taking care of your little flock of sheep, huh? Why don't you head home and take care of them and leave the fighting to us? But the word spreads. There's this kid who says he can fight this giant. Finally, the word reaches King Saul, and Saul sins for David. So David comes to Saul's tent, and when, when, when Saul, the king, sees David, the, this is the guy who says he's going to fight Goliath, this nine-foot giant? I mean, this is just a kid. And he says, he says to David, you know, you can't fight this giant. I mean, you're just a boy. He's been a, a soldier, a warrior since he was a boy. And David responds in an amazing way. He says, your servant, I, when I was a shepherd, sometimes a, a, a bear or, or a, a lion would come and grab one of the sheep and run off with it. And I would chase the bear or the lion and I would fight with it and kill it and bring back the, the lamb to the flock. In the same way, I can fight this giant Goliath and the Lord will give me victory. It seemed hopeless. I mean, this boy fighting this man, but there really was um, no other alternative. Nobody else was stepping forward to volunteer. So Saul says, I guess that's what we'll have to do. So Saul takes his armor. Now, Israel, in their army, nobody had armor except King Saul and his son Jonathan. So Saul, remember, whose head and shoulders bigger than anybody else, takes his breastplate and his armor, and he puts it on David, and he gives David his helmet and the sword, and David puts them on, tries to walk, tries to move with them. He, this isn't going to work. And he takes them off, and he leaves them there with Saul. And he steps out to go across the Elam Valley to where Goliath is. And he has three things. He has his shepherd's staff, and he has a sling. And as he crosses the valley, when he comes to this brook, he reaches down and he picks up five smooth stones. And he puts them in his sack and he heads out across the valley. Now, Goliath is there on the other side. And Goliath, this, 
nine-foot giant looks down at David coming, this boy coming at him. And you know what he does? He laughs. Whoa, he says, you know, what, what am I, a dog that you send a, a boy to fight me with sticks? And he curses David by all of his pagan gods. And then he says, come here, boy, come here. Today, I'm going to kill you and cut off your head and I'm going to leave your flesh for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field to eat. And David, 12, 13-year-old kid, a shepherd boy, looks up at this giant and he says, you, you, you come to me with, with sword and spear and, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel whose armies you have defied. And this day the Lord will give you into my hand. For the battle is the Lord's. And, and everybody here will see that the battle is his. And the Lord God Almighty will give the victory to me today. And everybody will know that the Lord brings victory. Not with, not with swords and shields. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give me the victory today. And David reaches, you know, and he's heading toward Goliath on the other side. And he reaches in his bag and he pulls out one of the smooth stones and he puts it in his sling and he takes that sling and he starts to go around and around and he lets it fly and it hits Goliath. Now remember, Goliath has armor all over his body, his arms, his legs, his chest, a helmet on his head. Where is he not protected? Right there. And the stone flying at such speed from David's sling hits Goliath right in the forehead and Goliath falls down. And David runs across the valley to, to Goliath. And he reaches and he grabs Goliath's big sword. And he takes the sword and he cuts off Goliath's head and he holds it up. And when the army of the Philistines see that their champion, the giant from Gath, has been killed, they're panicky and they run and they run all the way back to Gath. And when the army of Israel sees it, they let out a cheer. And they begin to chase the army of the Philistines away from the, from the valley. That story really impacted me as a kid. And as I think about it today, I think there are some really important lessons that maybe we can learn from that story as well. And three of them I want to mention just quickly. And the first one is this. We need to remember God's faithfulness. So that's what, that's what David did. If you look in, in, in 1 Samuel verses uh, 34 and 35, it says, you know, David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it and struck it and, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and then killed it. See, David does a really wise thing. He remembers the faithfulness of God. How about you? And has God been faithful in your life? Have there been times that you think of where you remember that the Lord was so faithful to you when he did the impossible, when he brought you out of a, a terrible situation? I would guess every one of us here today have times like that in our lives when God has shown his faithfulness and his love and his power. And what we need to do is we need to remember those events and we need to talk about them. Now, I would really encourage you, as you think about the things that God has done for you, you need to tell those stories to your friends. You, parents, you need to tell those stories to your children. They need to know that you trusted in God and God was faithful and he brought you, you know, through the valley he blessed you. He provided for you. He healed you. He did those amazing things for you because God is a faithful God. David remembered the faithfulness of God. He helped me to, to fight a lion and a bear. And to me, this giant is just going to be like one of them. That's what God does for us as well. He's faithful to us so we can remember and bank upon that faithfulness. Second thing, we need to know our own strength. One of my favorite psalms in the Bible is Psalm 139, a psalm written by David. At one point, David writes this. He says in 13, For you, God, created my inmost being. 
You knit me together in my mother's womb. I, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. David recognized, even as a boy, that God had made him and given him skills and abilities that he could use in God's service. That's what God has done for you as well. You realize that, don't you? That God made you, and he made you the person that you are for a reason. Your abilities, your skills, your, your life is something that God is planning and wanting to use in his kingdom service. You're not who you are by accident. You are who you are because that's how God made you, and he wants to use you. And so we take how faithful God has been, and we take our lives as we look at who God made us to be. And then our third point, then we trust in God. It's like what David said. So it's kind of a funny place in the story, isn't it? Where David comes and he's going to try to fight Goliath. And he gives this, uh, this story about how he's been able to fight the, the lion and the bear. But Saul thinks it's going to depend on armor. And he puts this armor on David. Let me just read you what it says in verse 38 and 39. It says, Saul dressed David in his own tunic, and he, and he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword under the tunic and tried walking around because he wasn't used to them. I, 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 I can't go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. And so he took them off. You know? God wants to use your life. He wants to use the person he made you to be. He wants you to draw upon the experiences that you have had with God to give you strength and courage, just like he did for David. I said I wanted to tell you a story. Let me do that in closing. A story from my life, back when I was about the age of David, maybe a little older. I think I was maybe 14 or 15. It was a Sunday night, and in Sunday night, our family always went to church together. But for some reason, my family went that Sunday night, and I stayed home. Apparently, I faked an illness or something, so I didn't go to church that night. So here I am, home alone on Sunday night, and I'm watching television. Now, remember, so this is like in the, in the mid-50s. So you t when I say I'm watching television, you know, it was this little black and white screen like this. And I'm watching television, and there was a program on called GE Theater on Sunday nights. It was just a half hour of a drama. And on that particular night, the drama was titled David and Goliath. And it was a, a reenactment of this story where David kills this giant Goliath. It was actually starring... Uh, Tony Curtis at that point, you know. And it was, it was not very well done. But God used that. I don't, I don't know before today if I've ever told anybody this story, but I watched that story of this young kid fighting this giant, and it, it touched my heart. And I remember getting down on the floor, on the carpet in our living room in front of the television and saying, God, I want to be a man like David. I want to have his courage. I want to have his faith in you. I want to serve you like he did. And it was a moment that God changed my life through a story like this of David and Goliath. So I would say to you today, you know, as you hear this amazing story of this young boy who trusted in God, what might God be saying to you today about how faithful he's been in the past, about how he's made you for his kingdom service and how you can trust in him today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this true story of how you worked in the life of a boy to save a nation. And I thank you for the way you used that story in my life. And I would pray for each of us that we would see that you're wanting to use us in ways that we might not expect also. Help us to, to remember your faithfulness, to talk about how good you have been to us 
to look at our lives and see how you have equipped us to use us in your kingdom service and help us to step out in faith even, even as David did.